Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to the National Endowment for the Arts for sponsoring the Understanding Stage. And thank you, thank you, thank you to these two <laughs> remarkable authors for sharing their time and talent with us today. To my immediate left, we have Shelby Van Pelt, author of Remarkably Bright Creatures. <laughs> You may have heard of it. Instant bestseller, New York Times, also read with Jenna Pick. And to my far left, we have the magnificent Henry Hoke, author of Open Throat, a book I'm sure you've all been hearing a lot about as well. So this is the panel, Animals Talk to Me. If you're here for George Saunders, I believe he starts at 515. It's not in this room. <laughs> is this anybody's first book festival? Is this anybody's first panel today? All right, all right, show them a little love. Okay, welcome, welcome. What you need to know is we are going to talk for about 35, 45 minutes, and at the end there will be a question and answer portion of our program. We will be delighted to entertain any questions you have up at either of these two microphones at that time. I'll give the high sign, I'll give you a little time to prepare. A question in our world ends in a question mark. If you are tempted for one moment to get up to that microphone and say, this is more of a comment, think of how you might <laughs> rephrase your thought. <laughs> <laughs> now, without further ado, Shelby, Henry, let's get into it. Would you please, each of you, I'll let you choose who goes first, introduce your animal narrator. Um, he is a giant Pacific octopus named Marcellus. Uh, an early draft of the book, I actually had the very first words of the book as my name is Marcellus. And then I read some handout at a writing workshop that said, never have the first line of your book be, my name is XYZ. <laughs> so I changed the first line, but um, he introduces himself to the reader in that very first page. He is in captivity in a small town aquarium in the Pacific Northwest. He is nearing the natural end of his life, uh, which is about four to five years for a giant Pacific octopus, which seems um, tragically short for such an intelligent type of animal. But um, yeah, he's cranky. He is, has a thousand hot takes about everything going on around him. Yeah. And my uh, narrator protagonist, um, the whole book is a monologue by a mountain lion um, living in Griffith Park, uh, just right on the edge of Los Angeles proper. Um, and they have a name that humans can't say that was given to them by their mother. But, um, but a, a teen witch who appears later in the book um, designates my cat Hecate, which is her pronunciation of the goddess Hecate. Um, and that really feels right to my lion at that point, this goddess um, figure. So um, Hecate is what I call my cat. And, uh, they're going through some things in the book. <laughs> So the, for the purposes of today's conversation, may we go forth with Hecate. Let's do it. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so I already know that Shelby gets this question a lot because we had, the, we had the pleasure of doing an event for the National Library Service earlier this summer. Uh, they provide free audio and braille books for readers, so shout out to the National Library <laughs> Service. Thanks for having us. So I know this is a question Shelby gets a lot, and Henry, I imagine you get a form of this question as well. So let's start with you, if you wouldn't mind. Mm -hmm. And it is, what compelled you to want to write from the perspective of a mountain lion? Yeah. Um, want is an interesting, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Maybe need. I needed, to, I needed to get outside of a human voice I think especially to write about Los Angeles and to write about my time in Los Angeles. I didn't feel so much myself in LA. Maybe I didn't feel very human. Um, and I was inspired by a, you know, a real mountain lion. P-22 was the um, you know, human designation for Puma-22, um, who lived in the Hollywood Hills and became kind of a local celebrity. Um, uh, and uh, and Knowing that, that that was a presence right around where I lived, I lived near Griffith Park in Los Feliz, which is a neighborhood, um, 
it always haunted me, and it was a figure I thought was like incredibly, like an incredible vessel for like understanding what LA was and is, the, the, the apocalyptic and the, urb, the urb, urbanity, the encroachment of urbanity. All those things, I think it became a celebrity for that in general and you know, urban wildlife. But for me, it was like, well, this might help me express all the things I want to you know, capture and contain and navigate about my 11 years in Los Angeles and everyone I was surrounded by is, struggles and conflicts and, and things that didn't make sense. I was like, well, that's the voice, that's the way in, yeah. Um, I saw a YouTube video about an octopus and thought it would be really cool to write that octopus's voice. I mean, I wish I had a better origin story. Um, you know, I'm a person who I always give my cats a voice, you know, they are talking to me in my head, so maybe it wasn't that much of a stretch for me. Um, you know, that's sort of the genesis of it, but it quickly became something more than that. I mean, it sort of started out this, as this fun in games, but uh, my human main character has a very difficult time relating to other humans. Mm -hmm. And in order to get her to break through some of her barriers and kind of access her own vulnerability, I don't think it could have been anything other than an animal. Um, that was just what she needed at that time. And I feel like, um, you know, particularly I wrote a lot of this during COVID. I feel like a lot of people kind of relate to that sentiment that, you know, sometimes um, a non-human companion can be so much less judgmental than the other humans that were around and, and so much more accepting of, of meeting us kind of where we are. Okay, let's dig into process in place, because in both of your answers, you gave kind of the tendrils of what I'm going to be pressing on here. Shelby, let's start with you. Your book is set in the Pacific Northwest. What's your personal relationship to the Pacific Northwest, and what was your proximity to the Pacific Northwest when you were writing the book? I, I grew up there. It'll always be home to me. Um, when I created this giant Pacific octopus character, I knew that I... I knew that I was going to set it there because I wanted him to be like 20 feet from his home. I think it would have um, not worked as well if he had been across the country somewhere. I wanted it to really have that proximity. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I have moved all over the country uh, since I left college, for college at 18. Uh, I've always kind of wanted to move back to the Pacific Northwest, but it just kind of hasn't ever been in the cards, so I think for me it was a way of reconnecting with my roots, absolutely. And then, you know, you throw in the pandemic layer where it was a time that I couldn't go home, and it was very comforting to me in my own homesickness to be able to kind of lose myself in this story that I was writing. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> place. Yeah, you mentioned you lived in L.A. Yeah, were I did. Were you in L.A. when you were writing this book? For my sins, I lived in L.A. I couldn't write this book until I'd left. Ah. Um, I moved back to, well, you know, I'm from Charlottesville, Virginia. I grew up around here a lot. Um, shut up. Um, <laughs> you know, and um, right after this book, I wrote a memoir about Charlottesville, Virginia called Sticker, which came out last year. But um, this book was my processing of the time I'd spent in L.A. I went to grad school there at CalArts. Um, no. <laughs> Hold for applause. Um, so, so I went to Cal Arts and then just stayed, and I was there for 11 years, and it flew by. It was dreamlike. It was strange. There weren't seasons, but there were fire seasons, and there were earthquakes, and there was a drought, you know, that was very prolonged. And these sort of things were very um, made time shift, and I think we've all experienced that with with COVID and getting through it. Um, that just time warps and we lose time and we lose years and, and we spend time uh, trying to process what's happening to us as it's happening. And all that was went into the book, but I had to be back in Brooklyn. I moved back to New York City um, where I'd lived before and was just hitting the winter hit. And I was like, oh, I want to be somewhere in my mind that is hot and dry and strange and and so LA was the move, and then I found the voice and, and visited it. Let's talk about voice then. Um, and one thing that's really interesting about both of these animal narrators is they kind of, um, they make the mundane strange again. They make the congruous incongruous. They give us a fresh perspective. And um, it actually gave me 
a fresh perspective on setting up this question because I do want to ask you both about the questions you asked yourselves in order to hone your narrator's voices. But before we do that, I thought, especially for people if this is your first book event of all time, maybe it's a little esoteric when we talk about voice. It's something I take for granted in my job all the time. Oh, it's so voicey, I love the voice. But you know, what, what are we talking about when we talk about voice in a novel? I mean, I feel like for, for Marcellus the Octopus, you know, there's one level of voice where it's just, you know, his, his tone, his way of speaking, the, the words he chooses to use. But, and I think with, with both of our books, on another level, it's about writing a creature whose world is not only different from ours, but is also a lot smaller than ours. Very, very compact. The range of experience that these creatures have and the things that, you know, you mentioned the mundane, sort of their daily routines and activities, they just live in a much more compact space. And so I think that affects, you know, the words that they use, the way that they speak, the way that they refer to things, uh, what they do and don't know about what might be beyond that small space that they're in, which of course we as the reader and the writer know. Yeah, I love that. I, I think that's very true. I, I wrote at one point for something different. Um, um, I wrote, uh, my helium voice is my real voice. Um, and, and I've been thinking about that because I was, I'm imagining, you know, my friend Catherine Lacey talks about narrowing focus as like one of the only ways you can write book length anything, you know, is you, you can't write everything, you know, or at least that's not the move anymore. <laughs> but like, to really narrow that focus, I think, I think about squeezing, like, like, a, like a balloon, or inhaling the helium, and tightening. And, that really is, it's a smaller, it's a narrower focus. Um, needs that we struggle with, with care and with um, gender identity and with scarcity, which my line ends up hearing is scare city, like a place we live in, scare city. Um, those things can be much more visceral and specific with an animal, like who is either being fed or having to go get their own food. And I love Marcellus's push-pull of like, oh, I'm not so crazy about what I'm being fed, so let's go, let's go get something better. <laughs> and Hecate is like very hungry and very drought-stricken and ashamed of what like they have to kill. So, um, so just that, it really was like the voice came out in the necessity and in the narrowing for me. And then it was just my voice. <laughs> For those of you who haven't had the pleasure of reading these novels yet, Hecate um, does have to pursue their own food, but Marcellus is both fed and also finds some creative ways to get some more delectable treasures throughout the book, I'd say. That's fair? He's a big boy. <laughs> okay, take me out of this. Physically, when we're... When we're talking about a giant Pacific octopus, do you have some rough dimensions for us? Um, Marcellus is about 50 pounds, which is big for a captive octopus. Uh, his uh, mantle, which is sort of the, the bulbous part, is about the size of a basketball. Um, and I mean, this came up when we were editing because it, it's like they have to handle him and pick him up. Like, is this possible? Things that I never thought I would have to Google, but. Right. <laughs> what, what are the specs on Hecate? Yeah, Hecate's, you know, the smaller of the big cats, so, you know, we're talking, you know, I don't know. I didn't do a lot of, um, you know, dimensional research. Ballpark. Because, again, I'm, I don't have a moment where we're outside of the cat's perspective, you know. Like, they get to see their own reflection once or twice and confront that, and what is that? But, um, but in general, I'm inside of it, so I thought about, you know, exactly what's in front of it. You know, I thought about the dimensions of the paws. I mean, I, I feel like Heck and I are probably about the same length, about six feet. Mm -hmm. um, probably similar, like, you know, similar skinniness on our, on our weight levels. <laughs> so I, I just felt a lot of, um, I felt a lot of that embodiment um, in doing so, like in, in just being inside of the cat, I thought about only what I could experience yeah. and the paws and the, everything else. Yeah. How did you define the limitations of their capabilities? Did you try to hew close to, you know, what an, animal of this ilk would be capable of, or did you take full fictional license and run with it? Go for it. Yeah, I mean, again, even just on the research level, I only did what was 
poetically helpful to me. <laughs> and then I, you know, went where I felt like going. Um, I think that obviously for both of us, like we, we, we play with language and with the idea of like having the capacity for language. I think that there is a chance that like an octopus has some some of a level of cognizance that maybe a big cat doesn't. But uh, you know, working with a smarter animal. But I think, but for me, it was like I, I just went with the like I had fun with the language and with the abilities and yearnings of a cat. Mm -hmm. But it's very much not like accurate. <laughs> you know, it's 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 fiction. Like it's the most fiction you can do, I think, and that's what I loved about writing it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it almost has to be in order to be any fun at all, right? Yeah. You, have to, you have to suspend some disbelief when you're coming into a book like this. I, I think for me, the line was, everything that Marcellus is doing is physically possible. If you were to observe an octopus, they really can escape through a hole that size in their tank. You know, they really can move about in this way and that and manipulate the objects around them. Obviously, everything that's happening in his head is pure fiction, as far as I know. Um, you know, cats can't understand human language to the extent that Hecate does. Octopuses can't read, as far as we know. But, you know, these are the things that you have to do in order to make an entertaining story, so. But for me, it was very much that physical versus narrative mm -hmm. line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any um, fun animal facts for us so we might win at trivia the next time we go? <laughs> Well, this is not about cats, but um, my, my, my big cat in real life, the P-22, who I was inspired by, Hecate is her own cat, but, but Hecate um, and P-22 did eat a koala at the Los Angeles Zoo at one point. So it happened, sorry, spoiler in the book that happens, but in real life that happened, you know, broke in the enclosure, ate a koala, dipped. The zookeepers were pretty devastated because they feel fondly for urban wildlife and P-22 and specifically, but they're like, I wish, you know, had enough food, didn't have to come kill our koala. Um, in the book, I named the koala, so I make it even more tragic, but um, <laughs> had, had to do it to him. But, um, but I found out that like, koalas are actually incredibly like, unpleasant, you know, they're not like cuddly bears, like, because I, over half the population have chlamydia. Like it's just like r runs rampant in the koala population. Uh, anyway, so a little chlamydia for your trivia. <laughs> um, but I was like, yeah, that's why they're always really like feral and chasing each other and upset. Like I think if you witness them, they're not the, the cute koala you think. And I, I love that. I love that about all animals. It's like, and e even across like gender and sexuality, like the things that we project onto animals, alpha wolf, all this stuff, like it doesn't actually relate to real animal things. And when you dive into it, you see the beautiful, bizarre spectrum of animal life. And so I love things like that, yeah. I've loved learning about otters and what jerks they are. I just think that's so funny yeah. in a similar way. You know, they're so, they're so cute, but like, <laughs> man, they can really, they can do some mean stuff to each other. Um, I, I would invite you to go down uh, the octopus rabbit hole on the internet because there, is, <laughs> there are so many fun facts out there that I couldn't name them all today. There was um, an octopus that recently came across my news feed who got annoyed at a bright light and shot water at it and broke it and like shut down power to the whole aquarium. Oh. And I'm just like, you know, go for it, buddy. <laughs> Belgian American psychotherapist, Esther Perel. I know, right? <laughs> no. I saw a quote attributed to her today and it was the pandemic left us missing intimacy and play. I think we've already spoken to the intimacy aspect in your answers about writing during the pandemic, and I'd love to talk about that more. But first, I'd like to talk about play. You know, among the other ways you regard writing, is it play for you? Is it playful? Um, for me, absolutely. Uh, it, well, you know, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I will say that writing Marcellus's point of view chapters was really fun. Um, it was a little bit less work than writing the human chapters. Um, and there, you know, there are only, I think it's only something like 50 pages of the whole book that is actually from his perspective. But, um, you know, when I think back to my time of writing, like that's what I think of as being on my laptop, like having fun with this, with this character. Um, so absolutely for me. Yeah, I mean, this was the most fun I've ever had writing a book. Um, they haven't always been easy for me, books. Um, <laughs> it's what I do, so. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I do think, um, 
Yeah, it was play until it was suddenly like, I, I guess like, you know, like you're playing as a kid and then like, uh, I mean, I don't know, I'm from the South, sometimes there were tornado warning sirens or something, or like you see the sky start to change, you know it's about to pour and maybe there's thunder. Like I think you get to a point in play or somebody gets hurt a little bit or like you get a cut and now you're bleeding. And what does that mean? Like I, that's what it felt like this book. I, I'd be playing from like my sort of meditative space I'd get into and then write the day of the cat's life and the observations and what it would encounter and what it would endure. And then it would get to this point where I was like, oh, this is like, I'm going through something. My cat's going through something. I'm putting it through something, you know? And the play suddenly became very serious. And I think that's why I was, I'd like, I still am very compelled to look over this book and experience it again as a reader even. Um, because I kept surprising myself of how deep I'd get into pretty serious upsetting or, or things that would resonate with me. I'd be like, that's exactly how I feel. But that came out of a cat talking about eating a bat or something. You know? like, so, <laughs> so like that, that, that level of like, I love play when it cascades into something much more. Um, and I think that's, that's what I aspire to every time I write, I guess, yeah. What was the revision process like and what was working with your editor like? All right, I'll start. Um, so, yeah, the revision process. Yeah, I, I, I wrote this very sharply, you know, and succinctly. I sort of, um, there wasn't a lot cut from it, which is pretty wild because it's, it's very short. It's unpunctuated and it's 18,000 words. So just, you know, shout out to, if you, you write short books, you're my people, I love you. Um, <laughs> there is a place for them. <laughs> but, um, but in writing the short book, yeah, I, I didn't think of, um, there was like a, I, there was a point where I got outside of the animal voice, where I, I chose something different um, for like a twist. It wasn't, you know, a major part of it as you've threaded your narrative voice with the octopus's voice, but, um, but that just had to go. I was like, no, like this has to be pure monologue. And, um, and so that was like the, the crafting it for a draft. And then when I sent it to my agent, um, who at the time wasn't my agent, but you know, you know, he loved the book. He was just like, what did you just give me? Like, <laughs> what, are, what are you doing? Like, in, in a very sweet way. Um, or like, I don't know where this fits in anything. And then eventually, uh, like, his wife told him, this is amazing, represent this person, you know, whatever. So like, <laughs> so shout out to her. But, um, but, you know, he woke up to the possibilities of just sending it out as is. And so really, we, the manuscript was what I drafted that we sold. And um, my editor, Jackson Howard at MCD FSG, um, did a wonderful job of opening me up to create more around what I already had, the leanness of it, to find moments of reverie, to interrupt what I was saying, sort of that play into plot, like where the plot would get really heavy and intense and roller coastery. He would let me step outside of that a little bit and sort of inspired me and prompted me to create a little more and a little more reflection and weaving memories and reverie, which, you know, because I had such a feral, like churning plot and visceral encounters of LA and hunger and violence, um, that was really, I was so grateful because there's nothing better than an editor who like, like excites you to write more in a voice. Like that was just so cool. Instead of just like, okay, this didn't work, cut this, you know, change yeah. that, blue to red, whatever, yeah. Um, so that was an absolute joy to work on new imaginings in editing, yeah. I actually heard your editor say that he received an email from your agent and the subject line was, queer mountain lion, question mark? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he said, your editor said, it was as if somebody had invented an artificial intelligence program that just banged out a perfect pitch for me. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We were meant to be. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I need you to teach me your ways. I think I wrote about 250,000 words of a book that is just under 100 in its final form, which is, mm -hmm. you know, very typical length. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I had no idea what I was doing. I still have no idea what I was doing. I, I had so many cul-de-sacs, we call them, mm -hmm. where you just go down this path and it just ends at a big, fat, pretty nothing mm -hmm. that you then have to cut. <laughs> because apparently all of the book has to advance the plot. Um, <laughs> No, uh, my, my editor was fantastic. It was probably a little bit more of a traditional, hey, let's see where we can pare some of this back and just be a little bit leaner and more efficient. Uh, there was a big, a big question of how much Marcellus should be in the book and um, you know, how much readers would sort of be willing to accept. And um, you know, I think maybe, maybe we should have put more, I don't know. Um, but I think... <laughs> 
Uh, I did. I did have a lot of Marcellus sections that were literally just him rambling, <laughs> and so we had kind of a, a rule that if if these sections were going to be in there, they had to offer something plot-wise or or advance some little nugget of knowledge toward the solving of this mystery. And so I had to kind of tweak some of them a little bit so that they were relevant and not just fun. <laughs> So, and just to be really clear, so there's a juxtaposition between these, you can't use first person, first creature point of view. <laughs> first creature point of view sections with a third person omniscient in Shelby's novel. And as Henry mentioned, he mentioned the word monologue. We get Hecate's um, first creature narration as well. And it was interesting to hear that you both considered maybe different balances of that through this process. Hmm, yeah. what next? Do you have any questions for one another? I just, it's, it's gratifying to like, you know, just what I was just describing about, you know, how much will readers accept in terms of the suspension of disbelief and the monologuing from an animal. I just, I have so much respect, I'm like, I think we were worried that we were doing too much, and then you went and did a whole book. So it's like, you know, I just love it when someone else can kind of take it, and you're like, I'm going to do even more, and even weirder. Like, yes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And please, best us. Please. <laughs> go, go forth and destroy our, our, our example. Um, there's probably as much word count of Marcellus as there is of Hecate. Like, that's, I think we're in a balance of like, yeah, especially with what you cut, you know, yeah. Um, I guess I wanted to just say, I mean, it was such a joy to read your book, and, and just, I've just met you, but, um, but, uh, but um, I thought so much about um, what you do with, I think it's been hinted at enough that I can talk about it, where Marcellus is like helping along a story that is, a, is like being uncovered, a mystery between two characters, and, and, uh, and there's more characters involved, but really these two characters, and I, I just thought it was so wonderful that the animal becomes aligned with the author, almost. Like, the, the way that you want to resolve a story, you know, that you, that you like, want to, um, that, like, we're about, they're about to miss each other, you know, like, it's like the things that we all, like, right, we're watching the movie, we're reading the book, we're like, oh, just, if only, you know, like, those horrible moments where people don't connect or things don't quite happen. And the, and the animal stands in for that and brings that in was so amazing to me, because I thought of you, I, I guess I, I felt like you, I felt you as the writer, as the author who, who wants to like have this plot be something beautiful and heartwarming, and the octopus comes through to do that. Yeah, um, I mean, he's, he's definitely a, a bit of a, a device in that way. I mean, he just yeah. um, has more, he's more observant than humans. He has more knowledge than mm -hmm. humans. He, um, he's able to just tie things together and um, without, I guess, I don't want to be spoilery, but you know, take sort of things that you've been suspecting anyway and, 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 and tell them to you plainly, okay, this is what's happening. This is what we're going to do. Yeah. This is what we're trying to do is help these humans who are just bumbling and idiotic <laughs> figure themselves out and help themselves out. Um, you know, one, one of the things that I enjoyed most about writing Marcellus was he, he's very condescending, but he also, I think, holds humans to a higher standard than we sometimes hold ourselves. You know, he really wants them to be better people than they are being in their, you know, kind of early book forms. Yeah, and don't we want that as writers, you know? <laughs> are we yearning for that, right? Like, Hecate does all the things I can't do, says all the things I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> um, unfortunately, it's my job to point out to you that your questions to one another were- They were, were completely common. In the form of a compliment. <laughs> We will accept questions in the form of compliments. We will accept yes. questions in the form of a compliment. I don't yes, know who I trust to do that. I don't trust myself to do that. <laughs> yeah. um, the next question I have for both of you is, what is your proudest achievement craft-wise with this book? What made your heart sing? I think one of my, well, Again, this is a little bit of a spoiler, but um, you know, the very first line, the thing that Marcella says is, uh, day, oh gosh, I don't even remember what it is, what day he's on. 1299, maybe? Mm. Um, 1299. 1299 of his <laughs> captivity. And 
And that was one of the very first lines that I wrote. I mean, that, was, that has not really changed. Maybe the number changed. But, but I always knew that I wanted there to be a day one of my freedom. And I didn't know much about, um, about where the plot was going to go. But I kind of had that line in my head. And I knew that I wanted to be able to use it somehow. And I, just, I really like those two lines together. For me, it's that. My, my significant tell you, some days I'm, I'm very, I very much am feeling myself as a writer. Like, I'm on my laptop, and I'm just like, you know, shut the laptop. I'm like, lunchtime, I, I nailed it. Like, uh, you know, I'm the greatest. I, I, I have to have that, I think. And, and those things are these lines that I just am like, that's like, that felt like it came from somewhere else. Like, that's like a, that's a t-shirt. That's like, and there are t-shirts now, like some of my lines, <laughs> and like hats, and what, you know, like people are doing things like that. Um, you know, Ron Charles at Washington Post called me the furry Jenny Holzer, or like, called Hecate a furry Jenny Holzer. Not like furries as the identity, but, <laughs> but like fuzzy, furred Jenny Holzer. And I was just like, that's it. So, so when I found those lines, I was like, this says more than I can even think into something that came out of me textually. Those yeah. lines are really powerful for me. Um, and and that's, my, that's the high I get from looking over the book, yeah. yeah. Ron Charles doesn't rave off. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't, and that was quite a beautiful review. Shout you out both, to Ron. You both have had some beautiful reviews. Do you read your reviews? Um, well, so the very first trade review I got actually was not super positive. Um, they, it, uh, I won't say the publication, but their, <laughs> their beef was that they thought it was too unbelievable. And I was like, okay. There's an octopus on the cover. <laughs> you open it up, and the very first line is an octopus introducing itself to you. Like, maybe this is not the book for you. I mean, it's not the book for everybody. But like, if you didn't realize you were going to have to suspend mm. disbelief, like, I don't know how to help you. Um, that is key, I think, is that like, <laughs> there's a lot of people that now everybody reviews, you know, like, and it's wonderful. I, I, you know. It's awesome so many people read books, and more should. And if, that, if, if to do that, it means that you have to assess it. Like, if you can't read a book unless you're going to put a like, thing on Goodreads, you know, God is bless you. That's fine. But, but, but I think that not every reviewer is going to be your people and is going to connect with your book on any level that you wrote it. And so I, 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 can, I do sometimes read reviews. I can't help but read the really nice ones, obviously. Like, and yeah. Even some nice ones, I'm like, yeah, like, great. But, you know, it's, it's like if a person connects with your book and expresses anything about it, it's kind of a cool exchange. But there is something to, um, there's a quality of writing in, in, edit, in, in, in reviewing. And I think that when I really connect with the writer, I'm excited and I'm open to what they say. I think otherwise I see people writing reviews. I'm like, yeah, well, they're not a writer I, I respect or care about. Like, what do they have to say? <laughs> You know, so don't read your reviews. Like, especially don't look at Goodreads ever if you're an author. Like, just, just don't do it, please. It will save your life and your mind and your well-being. I will say there's something kind of funny, though, about the, the, the negative reviews that are, like, very long and detailed. It's like, oh, you had a lot of feelings, and you took a long time to do this. Mm -hmm. You couldn't have made it that much. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just like, you know, you stirred something in someone that, yeah. you know, even if they really took issue with the way that you did some things or didn't resonate with them, like, but, but you know, yeah. but they took the time. Yeah. A lot of times. Thank you for your service, you know. <laughs> In the course of your answers, I realized that I failed to introduce myself. My name is Megan Labrice. I'm the editor-at-large of Kirkus Reviews, Woo. a trade publication <laughs> for books. Yes. And a past president of the National Book Critics Circle. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that, Shelby, that was not our review. No, no, it was not. No, Absolutely no. not a Kirkus review. Kirkus gave us both really great yes. reviews. Um, <laughs> so, you know. Let's, let's, let's get... We're let's not going to fight backstage. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't duplicitous at all. Hey, we're going to take it a little bit lighter. Aside from the real-life animals you credit with inspiring these books in part, P22 and the YouTube octopus, who have been the most influential animals in your life? Uh, I'm a cat person, so I've always had cats. Uh, they are my, my writing buddies, uh, my constant companions. I talk to them. In my mind, they talk back to me with their facial expressions. I know that they don't really, but um, yeah, you know, I think, you know, especially when I was doing so much of this drafting during COVID, like it was just such a 
lifesaver to have. A another being that didn't need anything from me, and I, I realize that's not entirely true. Obviously, they do need care, but didn't need something from me in the way that like my kids and my husband felt like they needed something from me. So um, yeah, I, I credit my cats. Follow up cats' names. Uh, um, one is named Sahana. The other is named Luda, short for Luda Kitty. Um, my three-year-old at the time named them. Yeah, I, um, the book is also dedicated, besides being dedicated to P22, um, I dedicated it to Jane, who was my cat when I was like a tween. Um, and Jane was probably the like, besides, you know, like this, this book is really just me and Jane, that's it. Like the bloodthirstiness, the actual literal catness, that's Jane. So like Jane was, Jane would kill everything. Uh, she, <laughs> she was indoor outdoor, you know, in this little wooded neighborhood where I grew up and, um, and she'd just bring, you know, squirrels, bats, you know, what have you, just bring them to me as offerings. And I say in the end of the book, it, for Jane who turned the pages, because, well, Jane would often sleep like on my head or next to my head in my bed um, after being, you know, bloodied by prey all day. But, um, <laughs> you know, just, uh, but what she would do is when I would read, she would come up and like, I'd be turning the page and she would bat it down. Like she would like either help me turn it or prevent me from turning it. And it actually did affect how I read. Sometimes I'm like, oh, okay, okay, Jane, you want me to stay on this page a little longer? <laughs> like, I missed something. Or like, oh yeah, yeah, keep going, you know. A, a page turner for Jane was any book in a way, but, but so, so she's, she's my real deep inspiration, yeah. I bat is impressive. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You, they can jump pretty high, the, these, and bats like to go low, cats like to go, oh, what the, oh God, that sounds like something. <laughs> Sounds like Michelle Obama, but <laughs> cats go low, cats go high. Not too hard. Heck, it gets a few in the book, so you know, that was Jane inspired. Yeah. We had bats in our house, so this was, this we didn't was, want this them there, the but they were in our. Yeah, <laughs> they would come up through the crawl space, and yeah. yeah, it was quite a house. There's a book about it called Sticker. So. <laughs> um, I too have a cat. I have a dyspeptic 15-year-old cat named Peanut, and we just introduced a wiggly-waggly six-month-old mini Bernadoodle puppy. And Peanut, if you want to talk about interspecies communication, <laughs> Peanut let me know exactly how she felt about that the night I was taking care of the house alone, and I'd done all the chores and put everything away and fed both pets. I went to lie down in my beautifully made bed, and it was all wet. <laughs> She had urinated all the way through into the mattress and yeah. into the center of the earth, pretty much. Ooh. Pray for Peanut. <laughs> Please write Peanut the novel. <laughs> well, you two do inspire me very much. <laughs> peanut so, by name, Peanut by action. <laughs> so, Shelby, this was your first novel. Would you have an animal narrator again? Um, you know, I would. Yeah. Um, probably not another octopus, and I do get a, a lot of people ask, "Are you going to write a sequel or a prequel?" And I, you know, I think that would be fun, but I don't. I don't think that I would want to write a different octopus who wasn't Marcellus. Mm. But like I said, I am totally the kind of person who is constantly giving things voices in my head, so that would seem a natural fit at some point. Henry, you write very different books, all kinds of different books. Would you write an animal narrator again? I mean, that's kind of your answer. No, I got to do something different every time. <laughs> this, was, this was my animal narrator. I may do non-human narrators, but uh, that's, that's exciting me right now. Is, uh, I'm writing in the voice of a lake right now, which is fun. Um, we'll see how that goes. A little wiser, but also adolescent. <laughs> I'm having a hard time here. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's not you. It's the echo. echo. Oh, yeah. Echo, echo. Yeah. All right. So, are we about ready to open it up for questions? OK. Who has a question? First timers, I still see you. <laughs> I remember who raised their hands. Come forth to the mics. All right. Okay. All right, now we're talking. Okay, we're going to start here, and then you are next. Thanks. Uh, my question's for Shelby. Um, I thought it was 
so beautiful how Marcellus helped all of the humans in your book. And I really liked Tova's character. Um, and I was wondering if you could uh, tell me a little bit about what inspired her. And other than the really awesome Octopus YouTube video, what sort of inspired you to have Marcellus be the one to help her? Also, what's your name? Oh, sorry, I'm Shy and Tony, and I lived in Seattle, and I love giant Pacific octopuses. <laughs> um, well, Tova is basically my Swedish grandmother, um, and I, I borrowed many, many aspects of my grandmother's personality uh, and put them into Tova, her, her sort of stoicism, mm -hmm. uh, her just difficulty in, in dealing with em emotions and feelings and sort of uh, constant insistence that everything is all right, which like um, I also struggle with. So, uh, you know, that was sort of a little bit of a self-discovery journey for me too to write that character. Um, and yeah, I just think that uh, you know she is so surrounded by people who want to fix her and who want to help her and who want you know they love her, but she has a, a difficult time receiving that love and. With Marcellus, it's funny because he is, in some ways, the most judgmental character in the whole book, just because he has so many opinions about humans that are often not complimentary. Mm -hmm. um, but he really accepts Tova sort of without judgment, and I think that's what makes her initially feel comfortable in sort of opening up to him. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Please share your name if you'd like to, and your question. Hi, my name is Janice Seipold. And Shelby, you mentioned something in one of your responses about the editing process and how much basically is kind of left on the cutting room floor or you know, the writer's version of that. And I, it just made me think of the parallels with movies. You know, movies. Some movies do extended versions or they have their blooper cuts or whatever. Does the writing world have anything like that? And this is for either, uh, either author. I feel like it, it. sometimes you'll get an extra chapter in like a special edition of a book. And I've always just assumed that those things come from some sort of cutting room floor. Um, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I save it all in a folder thinking like maybe yep. I'll use this for another a short story or a different book someday. Um, yeah, I have my boneyard, which is things I like, but that just had to be cut and didn't fit. I don't, I don't uh, you know, I teach my students, um, don't kill your darlings, clone your darlings. Like we live in an age of bountiful and, you know, technological ability. So just copy paste it into your boneyard and you'll find it for something else. It didn't work for this. You, you love it. Don't kill it. Keep it somewhere. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Alex. Thank you both for being here. My question is for Henry. Uh, I read Open Throat and I loved it, um, but I was really curious because you both talked about the playfulness of language tonight, and I noticed that with Hecate, he's pretty playful with language too. But I thought it was interesting because we know in instances where Hecate calls LA, uh, he calls it LA, but it's E-L-L-A-Y, and then we know things like the long death, but we know it's the highway, uh, just things like that. But I noticed in the very beginning pages or early on, that the use of cuss words um, seems really confident that Hecate uses, and he didn't seem to have any confusion about that. Mm -hmm. So I was really curious about what made that, maybe I was overreading it, uh, what made a conscious reason why Hecate is so, why it's so easy profane. to use that. Yeah, <laughs> profanity and things Because just like I am, um, I'm very, um, <laughs> I've been restrained today, but you know, my, I was on NPR, my mother was like, don't cuss on NPR. I was like, don't say the F-bomb to Scott Simon, and I didn't, and I'm very proud of myself. Um, but yeah, um, Hecate is learning language not only from, you know, later in the book, an 18-year-old witch, like rich witch in Los Angeles, um, but also from hikers and, um, and a unhoused population that they live near, a small tent group in Griffith Park. So like there's a lot of profanity bouncing around in this cat's head. So that was never a question for me that, you know, every measure of, of those words would be just an easy part of a contemporary Los Angeles vocabulary. And you know, yeah, and it was fun. I think it, I think it feels cathartic for the cat to grab those words and throw them out there. Um, I can't write honestly without profanity. Does that answer your question? Yes, it Great does. Great question, thank you. thank you. Nice hat. Hi, my name's Rhea. I am a fellow cat person. Yay! I, I'm wearing a cheetah shirt today. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, I, I read Remarkably Bright Creatures. I loved it. And I already put Open Throat into my Amazon bin. So I am, but uh, I have a question totally not about 
um, like writing, writing, but instead listening. So the way I access a lot of books is through audiobooks. And so I only listened to Remarkably Bright Creatures, and I saw that Open Throat has an audio book. So I was wondering, how do you pick the person who is going to be your voices? Because I was, as authors. Um, well, I guess the short answer for me anyway is you, you don't get full control over that. Um, I mean, it's a collab for me at my publisher, and I'm assuming you have some version of this at yours. They, you know, they sort of gave a list of here's some candidates that we think would be good for this role, why don't you listen to their samples, you know, we want everyone to be happy, let's try to get someone that you like and that we like and that wants to participate. Um, I got very, very lucky with my audiobook narrators. Uh, Michael Yuri plays Marcellus the Octopus. Uh, he is on the HBO show Shrinking, he's like the, the friend. Um, and it's just, he's so perfect. Um, I got very lucky, yeah. Um, yeah, similarly, I, you know, FSG gave me a, a auditions by four um, readers, and, and one of them uh, I knew. And he was also just incredible at the role, but, um, but I knew him. Um, my signif went to acting school with him, and he'd gotten friends of mine jobs and stuff like that. I was like, well, okay, well, of course, but also just he just nailed the voice of it. And he, only after I was like, yes, this is the guy, I found he like did Moby Dick too. So I was like, all right, you know. <laughs> Moby Dick, open throat. <laughs> we can hang, you know, 18K words and then however much Melville sought to, to give us, to gift us. So yeah, um, that was it. I mean, it was really, we, we, so we got very lucky, I think. And, Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Luke. Um, I am a writer here in DC and I'm actually facilitating a workshop soon about writing animals for trans writers. Um, and a question that really motivates a lot of my work is the ways we conceive of the natural as a concept, um, whether we consider something natural or unnatural in human bodies um, or in like you know more ecological settings. So one, something I want to ask you, Henry, is um, Hecate is a genderqueer mm -hmm. animal, mm -hmm. and I wanted to know your thoughts on the ways queerness gives you access to writing animals and also vice versa, how, how animals give you access to writing queerness. That's a fantastic question. Um, that sounds like a fantastic workshop. I like, want to take it. <laughs> like, if you want me to say hi to you, you know, like, <laughs> let me know. Um, let's get in touch. But um, yeah, that, I mean, that was the crux of this for me. I was like, well, I mean, when I started writing The Cat, I didn't think like my, my agent pitching this queer mountain lion. I was like, well, I'm writing The Mountain Lion. I'm a queer person. <laughs> I'm going to write a queer narrator. But seeing the potential for the journey mm -hmm. through gender, um, because, you know, this cat is, you know, AMAB or whatever, right? He's grown up socialized, like male, um, but then becomes affirmed as like a goddess, you know, later on, and a she, and there's a lot of that um, cathartic and affirming quality to the book. Um, it came really fluidly through this narrative, and I was so surprised because I was like, well, you know, even if I had sought to create that architecture of a trans journey, the cat gave me more ways to do that, like because it was like it's already outside of human sexuality. It's already isolated. You know, there was all this projection on P22 of like eligible bachelor, like the Brad Pitt of mountain lions will never mate. I was like, do we all need to mate? Like it was just like it was really like. Um, so that was really fundamental for me. It was like let's just change that. Like that's not the yearning this cat is going to have. This cat is going to have like a queer crush and a tragedy in its past. This cat is going to be looking for something else to affirm its existence. It's going to be looking for revenge beyond like mating. It's going to be looking for like, uh, yeah, righteous expression. And so those, those were the ways those, those dovetailed for me. And, and it was from within and from without. And I was very grateful for the, for the voice for that. And that sounds, I'm so excited. Cool. <laughs> Thank I, you so I have much. a lot of fun with that, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, hello. Uh, my name is M.M. Um, I often, I mean, have an easier time writing from non-human perspectives, um, but there's this one narrative that I've been struggling with, I think because as I've gone on, I've I felt like too close to the narrator or realized that I'm trying to like directly translate experiences into that kind of like other world, other fresh perspective that you both have spoken about. Um, I guess this is more for Henry Hoke because I haven't read your book yet, sadly. Um, but do you kind of, 
you talked a little about like a meditative state and a flow state. Yeah. Did you ever translate directly or were more like conscious of like, this is something I've experienced or like a snippet of dialogue, particularly with like the hikers that I'm going to put in here? Or was it more just like a subconscious stew? And was it like difficult going from one to the next? Yeah, great question. And, and I think a, an ongoing question, right? Um, I, I feel that um, the meditative state was just that I would meditate for 20 minutes and then I would and I would meditate towards the natural space that my cat was going to find itself in. So I was like, I'm in a cave right now because the cat's going to wake up in a cave. I'm in a thicket because the cat's going to wake up in a thicket. I'm under a mansion. You know, whatever. <laughs> Spoiler. But, um, but there is this, uh, this sense that But what I had to grab to really get through it was overheard dialogue, was things that I had said. There's lines that I spoke. There's lines I heard people speak. There's conversations I've had. Almost everything in the book is from a real thing, in a way. Like, I didn't make up much. I have so much. I had 11 years in Los Angeles of the discourse, right, too. Like, everything I didn't respond to on Twitter or whatever. Like, all of that was the, the little morsels that got me through the writing process. Um, so, yeah, grabbing from that. I think continuously grabbing, without, maybe without an aim, but with, like, it anchors you to get through the writing. You might find that you'll dialogue or your character will dialogue with that found thing, that inserted thing, in a different way than you would or that you'd set out to do. And so that's how I do, it's the same way I talked about narrowing and like helium or whatever, tightening. I do think about like letting your ideas or your, what you set out to do bounce against things that you didn't. Like making little different choices or just throwing some strange moment in. I had great things like, oh, well, there's gonna be an earthquake right now. Like what does that do, right? Um, so creating that paradigm can really help, I think, with what, does that help answer your question? Yeah, no, thank you, especially like the little anchors and the different choices, that's incredibly helpful, thank you. Just, yeah, keep, keep, keep bouncing off of things instead of like thinking you can find one straight path. I think that never works for me. I always have to, have to upset, I have to interrupt Well, my straight own path wouldn't work, yeah. <laughs> well, Thanks very much. Oh, yeah. sorry, yes. Um, I, I think when I'm writing non-human characters, for me, so much of it is about sitting and listening mm. and just, um, you know, particularly you have a, a, a non-human character who is around humans. Um, my character is very bored and spends a lot of time <laughs> observing. So I tried to, this became harder during COVID when everything was shut down, but just spend intentional time sitting and listening and absorbing in almost a passive way. Like not imploring myself not to react to the conversations I'm hearing around me, but just to like absorb them um, in a way that you know, maybe an, an animal or a, a table or a lake or a whatever might, might experience those things. Yeah, yeah, totally. yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm excited to finish your book and to start yours. <laughs> thank, you thank you for you, the MM. question, MM. And finally, A Subconscious Stew. That's a really good title or a subtitle. Mm -hmm. you should write that one down. I love that. Hi, my name is Liesl. I'm a children's librarian um, in a public library. Woo! So I read a lot of books for kids, um, and a lot of books for kids have animal protagonists. Um, although I have read Remarkably Bright Creatures, and I loved it, and I'm very excited to read Open Throat next. Um, so I just wanted to ask you guys if you had a favorite fictional animal protagonist, uh, maybe from a children's book or from another adult fiction writer, um, and I would love to hear about who they are. Um, well, I, I have two that come to mind. Um, the one from my childhood would be Charlotte's Web, uh, which it, it was one of my favorite books. It's been one of my kids' favorite books. Um, you know, there's, there's a line in the book that really resonated with me when I was drafting, um, and I was at the same time rereading Charlotte's Web aloud to my kids, and it's, it's the two parents talking, and I think the, the dad says, you know, oh, Fern spends so much time down at the barn with these animals, and it's just nonsense. Everyone knows that animals can't talk. And the mom replies, um, well, you know, maybe, maybe we just don't know how to listen or something. I probably butchered that. Please don't, whoever's recording this, don't quote me. Um, but, you know, just that really, I, I feel like that, I, I took that to heart um, when I was writing. And for Stick Dog, my son is obsessed with. I don't know if you know this book. This is my favorite contemporary one. He's a snarky wild dog who has snarky wild dog friends and they run around and make fun of humans and it's absolutely fantastic. Mm. <laughs> I learned to read with Calvin and Hobbes, um, the comic strip and in, in, the, in the anthologies. Like that's, that's why I know a lot of really dark, strange things and words. <laughs> it's a very bizarre thing to learn to read with, but I did. Um, and so that's really what, what it is for me, is, is the relationship between Calvin and Hobbes, and they're both full human beings. Uh, 
Yeah. Well, even though one's the other stuffed animal. Yeah. Um, that was, that's it. That's the lodestone of my creativity, I think. Beautiful. I've got one for you, too. It's called Edgemont. It's by Marjorie Weinman Charmont, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the reader's dilemma. You really never know how the author's name is pronounced because you just see it on the book. Picture book about an old bored turtle who has holes in his socks, who is despairing until he meets a lady turtle, and then they tell all their lifelong stories to the rat and mice children of the neighborhood. That's adorable. Mm -hmm. Favorite. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for being a children's librarian. Hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Kimberly. Um, uh, Shelby, your book was a joy to read, just a joy. My question is about, it's a human question, about mothers and motherhood. So we see Tova at the end of her motherhood journey. There's a pregnant woman. There's a knitting group. There's a mother with a teen age child. And I just, I'm curious about the theme of mothers and motherhood. Was that something that you really centered in the book or um, was it really just present for you? I'm really curious. I mean, it was, it was a very present part of my life at the time that I was writing it because I had two young kids of my own. Um, and it's so funny to me that I, I feel like I wrote every character except myself directly into the book because um, there really aren't any young kids like that. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, the, the central you know, the central sort of motherhood relationship, that of, of Tova and her, her missing child who had died many, many years before, you know, just really comes out of my own, like, anxiety as a parent. And you think of, like, what is the worst thing that I can imagine going through? And then just trying to live that through my character. Thank you, Kimberly. Okay, these will be our last three questions. Please, go ahead. Hi, I'm Rebecca. Um, both of your books have such a beautiful format in print, and I was really curious what went into that on your side of things, because I know, like Shelby, your book is, obviously the cover is great for both of them. Yours has really nice illustrations on the chapter titles and stuff. And Henry, with your book, with the monologue format, it's very unique, and I was just curious how much went into that and how that gets like translated into audio and ebook format. Um, I can be pretty brief with it. I just, I, I like to write in sort of fragments and line breaks, so just more poetically. My book has no punctuation. It uses line breaks for spacing and breath. Um, and it's also how I read, you know, like just how I pace how I read and that's how Pete, my, my narrative, you know, my audiobook reader did it. So it worked really well as like a, it seemed to work like even in his audition. I was like, he gets it. He gets why I wrote it like that and how it's supposed to sort of come across. And I wrote it like that in Word, and they went with it, and it looks exactly like that in the finished copy. So that was, I was very grateful to have people who, who got it you know, throughout. Yeah. Um, I think because my book does something a little bit strange, it shifts from a first-person narrator in Marcellus to a third person. They really wanted to make sure that people understood that. I mean, it's fairly obvious, but... Um, it's just that visual marker of like, okay, hey, we're shifting into this other narrative form. Um, you know, I, I, I love the, the artwork that they put with it. It's great. And then, you know, in the audiobook, they had two different narrators for the octopus sections versus everything else. So, um, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, I can't take credit for most of that. My publisher kind of did the heavy lifting on that, but really um, put some time and effort into making the, this unusual format a little bit more digestible. The openings of the Marcellus chapters have these beautiful tentacles coming yeah, down, like um, sort of shaded tentacles on each. You guys won't be able to see. On the, like the dog ears, it's really, but yeah, so little, it just, just yeah. gives you that octopus flavor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What's your name? My name is Grace, and since you didn't really know how the book was going to end when you started writing it, as you started to create the characters, did that ever influence the plot at all? Um, yeah, that's a great question, Grace. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for me, the characters definitely influence the plot. Um, I, I'm not a plotter. I'm more of a pantser, as we say. So I kind of, I, I often just will put like two characters together and give them a mildly frustrating situation and see what happens. And that's how I get a lot of my plot points. Yeah, for me, I, in a way, I knew the ending, but it was like what I said about playing and having the thunder. And I mean, I was like, I'm, I'm going to have to get there sometime. I'm not going to spoil anything, but um, 
But it was, you know, it was a hard, hard thing to do. It came from, from knowing that I, I, don't, I, I had to do it to him, you know? Like I had, it had to be, to create meaning, it had to go where it went and it had to continue and follow it. Like, and it is, but what I wanted was for the characters, the character, like, the desire had to lead to the ending. It couldn't just be from without. It had to be like, okay, no, this character is going to, there's a line, it's a terrible choice, but I'm making it just like a person. <laughs> <laughs> like, like the knowledge of, of your actions having consequences, um, but that you must do them. That, that was why it m made sense to me and why it mattered to me. So it was very much like I had to earn my ending yeah. with the character getting there. And I think that was important. I think that is always kind of a, that's a key to creating, to, to finishing this ridiculous enterprise of ours, of <laughs> writing books, yeah. Okay, time is up, but we're breaking all the rules here at Animals Talk, so may please bring us home. Hi, I'm Sarah. Uh, Shelby, there are so many parallels between Marcellus and Tova, and I was just wondering how you went about bridging that connection between species and exploring the relationship between humans and animals. Well, yeah, I think they're both um, fundamentally very lonely, and, and they, they figure that they have that in common. Um, you know, Marcellus at one point makes uh, this observation that he has no one to talk to. In the, like, he can't, he's smarter than everyone else. He can't communicate. Um, he's kind of on an island, and then, you know, Tova's more on an island of her own making because she has put herself there and kept everyone else at arm's length. Um, it just felt like a very natural friendship to me for that reason. I feel like they were just, they are, they are kind of kindred spirits. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.